Here we have it. One awesome Trek 5200, the classic OCLV. Yes, this frame was being manufactured by Trek for several years. And this particular bad boy is in for a tune-up. This has seen some miles from the original owner telling me that it's done like the Oregon to Seattle, Portland, Oregon, the Seattle rides and the wet and then the rag bride several times and a couple of biathlons. This cat is actually a pretty decent athlete. And needless to say, this bike has had some use, but it's been sitting for a long time and he's getting it ready for the MS 150, which is a local ride here for charity for multiple sclerosis. And um, that's one of those things that I've been doing for support with my family for the last 30 years. So I am excited to work on this bike and get it into shape for this guy to do this event after all these years of his riding and experience. So this is going to be pretty cool. It has some pretty uh, neat little tidbits. You know, you got the Altegra componentry, but you got also the Rolf wheels, which is a classic period piece of a wheel set. We'll do a little more detail on that as well. But without further ado, let's dive into this beautiful bad boy. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles, hanging out with a guy. Hi, I'm Justin the Guy. Obviously I have a garage shop. Take scary how to use one bike at a time. If you want to be kept up to date on latest projects and topics, please like and subscribe. Welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles, hanging out with a guy. Hey, I'm Justin the Guy on this old bike series and we're checking out this 5200 from Trek. Beautiful OCLV, clear coated carbon, Ugh, pretty. Gonna do some nice, awesome detailing on this. He picked a little bit of upper level package, so we're gonna do some serious cable replacing, drivetrain cleaning, wheel truing and detailing with some ceramic coatings for the wheels as well as the frames and ah, all this great stuff is gonna go onto this bike. It's gonna be pretty awesome. Uh, I'm gonna inspect, of course, any kind of ah, questionable things. It's been used quite a bit over the years. Uh, workhorse, his basically comment to me was, hey, I look for new bikes, but I just can't go away from this one. It's just, just one of those beautiful workhorse uh, early 2000s road bike. And sure enough, I mean, to look at today's standards of what you're looking for a full carbon with old Tiger componentry, you're going to be shelling out of what, what, four, five, six thousand dollars, if that much, if not more. In this case, this classic beauty with a triple chain ring up front. Um, it's a wonderful bike for the Colorado where we have these things called the hills here or called mountains and if you're going to do any kind of like pass riding like a double pass or a triple bypass type riding uh, events this is the bike this is the componentry you would want to have obviously the industry is switched over to a one by or two by trying to shed down some weight I guess um, try to get rid of that front derailleur as much as possible. I see the benefits to it to some level, but on the flip side of it, you're losing that extra gear range that smoothes the transition of shifting and finding that exact gear to stick with while you're riding. It's kind of like your elite componentry being trickled down. And for the recreational riders, we're kind of being subjected to the high level-ish concept but with cheaper componentry, I don't know. I think it's a hot mess, but without further ado, let's dive into this beautiful thing. Uh, oh yeah, OCLV, Autumn Compact Low Void. They brought the OCLV little trademark thing back to the lineup in Trek of the current bikes with the carbons. The, the Kool-Aid is basically, it's more of a higher compact carbon which is a little bit stronger uh, this particular vintage was bonded together so it wasn't using that layering system so they would have the like the top tube the head tube the bottom tube, you know, bottom bracket area would be like all individual pieces lugged together and glued while well, the couple benefits of that is while well, the tubing itself is a lot stronger it's thicker really what it is and in addition to i mean yeah you got a little more weight but you lose weight on the higher end ones on the lower end whatever <sighs> ah, okay but back in the day we were able to debond these tubings and replace them so if you had a crash and you crunched your chainstay or your top tube you were able to get that debonded or rebonded as well as the dropout itself but 
Trek no longer does that in-house. They only did it for a few years. Um, you can still get carbon repaired by several hundred different carbon repair shops out there, uh, which will do, so a lot of them do a fantastic job. So carbon's not a, a, a thing to be afraid of, as well as the carbon was being tested even in the 90s of the flex where they put the frame, you've probably seen this on videos before where they put the frame in and it's constantly flexing the frame back and forth, back and forth. I kind of do the Egyptian thing here. Um, what that does is, um, you know, it kind of cycles through and they do different points like the head tube has a is shifting back and forth and the crank set back and forth. With, they tested with aluminums and steels and titaniums and carbons and the first one to fail was aluminum because it was a different material and eventually it would crack over thousands and thousands of cycles. The next one would be the steel frame which held up a lot longer than aluminum but eventually did fail as well as well as titanium eventually at some point. But carbon fiber, did, well, they came to this infinite flex cycle, which in other words, it never broke down to the duration of the test. That being said, the Kool-Aid was drinking, OCLV, Optum Compact Low Void, carbon fiber bikes today. There's a lot of misnomers out there that it breaks down, it ages, or what have you. If it's sealed correctly, put together correctly, it should last a very long time. And I've been working on a lot of these carbon bikes for the last that are two to three decades old and they seem to perform just well. And actually for those who are just recreational riding that enjoy riding and getting into it and that kind of thing, not you racers, you got a whole new breed of bikes for yourself to play with. But for these particular ones or just starting out and seeing if you want to do those events like triathlons and so forth, recreational racing, these are awesome bikes. Don't need to shy away from them. Just need to make sure they're tuned up correctly and they're safe to ride. And well, more and most important is if it's the right size for you and also fitted. So when you cover those points, these bikes will last you a long time. And a lot of my customers I have sold bikes to that got into riding and found that love again from their childhood days or whatever they came from from cycling before kind of lost it and they got back into it. They're upcycling to the next level carbon like this one here. Um, you can still find the next or two, three levels in the used market to actually help you with that journey. So back to this tune up here. This one has the, the, mad, the, the guy's magic tune up, basically cables and housing, detailing the frame, um, pretty much everything except for the picture packet that I would do for resale. They didn't need that, of course, but I'm really excited about this one because it has the Rolf Comp, uh, Vector Comp wheels, which I featured in the previous videos. You can check my library below. Uh, but um, I had some questions from those videos. I'm gonna make a separate one video, one off on this from the wheels specifically to feature those questions that were brought to one of you guys that actually watch my channel. Awesome, thank you for watching, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, let's, let's do some getting the all into it and check this out. So going through the bike and checking out some different details, you know, release the brakes here by the old Tegra, there's a little lever. A lot of these road bikes have these little levers to open up for road bike calipers and you shift the derailleur into the smallest cog so it's easy to drop out. So I will be taking this cassette off, cleaning the ultrasonic cleaner, as well as the skewers, checking the hubs. Man, so smooth considering the age, my goodness. Right out of the gate, super smooth. These had a very, they were built really well. And, um, and ones I've seen that haven't had damage from like crashes or what have you, just for general use, hold up. And these are pretty nice. And still has a good, good sound of a cassette there. But in any case, I wanted to point out while I'm here on the inside of the dropouts on these guys. So on the OCLVs, on these older ones, um, they have the dropout and the serial number will be stamped here as well as the decal underneath. But they also stamp the serial number and the size. So if you come across a used one and you're trying to figure out what size it is, it's going to be right here. This is a 60 centimeter in this guy and kind of a close up. These are not replaceable dropout hangers. So that's something you want to... Keep mindful, I mean, road bikes is not too terrible because you're not bashing through the woods like you do with a mountain bike, right? But for road bike, still an issue. This is the Kiwi's Hill, so if this gets damaged, bent or cracked to the point where you can't fix it, it's pretty much toast. But 
And there's probably a kid or two out there somewhere that does replacement or you make it a single speed if you want to go that direction. But most of these are so beefed up that you don't usually have an issue unless it was a pretty good crash. And sometimes it's the crash is related with a vehicle. So in any case, um, that's what we're looking at here. The Altegra triple has a longer cage rear derailleur. If you're going to switch it over from a double to triple, you need a longer cage derailleur here. Rig pads look pretty good for the calipers. So basically we're going to be taking these guys off and clean them in the ultrasonic cleaner. All right, while well my parts are cooking and cleaning, I wanted to go over what the flight deck computer is. <laughs> yeah, Shimano had an integrated computer system that went into the shifter hoods and you can control the little buttons on both sides and also showed you where gear ratio, where you were at, which was kind of cool along with like the max speed, average speed and all that good stuff. They did make a wireless version of this, but this is a wired one. And the customer no longer feels like he wants to deal with that old tech. So we're going to take this bits off. But I'm going to save it uh, so, it, you know, just in case he decides to go back or maybe sell the bike at some point and have the flight deck as a prop. It still works. It's just the batteries are dead on it. And um, I'm sure it will be just fine. Also, I need to get the computer stuff all off of this here to clean, you guessed it, the shifters as well. Uh, even though they still seem to shift fairly decently, uh, they just do, they do need to come off to be put into the ultrasonic cleaner and pull the cables out as such to do such a beast. But I wanted to show, show you how these are taken off. And they basically, you have to pull the hood up to get to the plate. I'm gonna remove this tape real quick without hopefully cutting the cable. Like so that way I can get a good lead off of it. And, and it's usually, it's tucked underneath and usually follows the line with the cable housing for the brake. So we'll just get this old, that's actually stock. <laughs> this is the original bar tape or the whoever taped on it because they used to do that little tape trick on the original ones. This has a Bontrager plug. Yeah, take that off. So now we got to get this little guy free. So I'm going to cut above the housing where the cable is not following the line and use the housing to kind of guide my release 
and there's usually extra cable from the you know, from the computer that you just saw that gets tucked in underneath. So yeah, this lies the the nightmare of installing computers back in the day that we really never really liked doing. It's one of those things is it's nice to have once it's installed, but as a tech factor, as a mechanic, these are always the the nightmare thing to deal with sometimes. The, actually, these weren't too bad. There are some that are cadence, which you had cables going all the way down the frame. This is before wireless became anything on the scene. And shift that out so I can get the cable out. Set that aside. I always keep them separately to, for measurement reasons. Then I take my old trusty old snap-on screwdriver and it fits right in here. There's two screws. One's on the bottom part, closer to the clamp. That need to. And you want to make sure you catch these little guys when they pop out, because once they hit the floor, they are no longer to be seen. And I'll need to save these screws. I have some old shifters that are dead that have just the the dummy plate, which I'm going to replace, pull those off of those and put the dummy plate in replacement of this so it doesn't feel like a gaping hole as when you're shifting or holding onto the brake hood. So, a little added attention to detail there. And, uh, and if I do lose the screw, I do have extras. But for yourself at home, when you're working on something like this, Make sure you keep an eye on it. Yeah, got it. Put it in a safe place. Now these guys, actually, I'm gonna do. Oh, where'd you go? Oh, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Tool hiding behind my coffee cup. Darn coffee cup. So I'm gonna take this shifter off and have you take a little Closer look, see what I'm doing here. So this guy should come off. Should have enough slack here to be able to take this guy off. And you have to monkey around the. Whoop, well, I'll just come there. There we go. And put this guy back in place. A couple threads in. <laughs> if it'll stay in there. Yeah. There we are. Maybe. So there we go. Okay, so what we got here, do a close up on this. This is plate and kind of work its, you know, use the, oop, that's the little sensor here that came with the kit. These, all these shifters have these wires built in there ready for that type of shifter. They made these for like seven, eight years. You'll see it on the 105s. Um, some of the lower ones, Darius had them as well, uh, which was kind of cool. So now you have this big gaping hole. Now what? Like I said, I had some dummy dead shifters and this is what the dummy plate looks like. It's basically, it looks the same as that, but, and you would have to take these off to install it, then you'd have these little extra plates. And of course, I grab the one that does the left versus right, but you'll get the idea. <laughs> um, pop this guy out. And keep in mind, since these are older, they might be a little stuck. And same thing, older, this is actually a, a gen before this one. And this is what the dummy plate looks like. Does it have any wires to it or anything? And what that guy is basically, when I find the right shifter one, will fit into this spot here and you screw it in. And that way it feels normal. You don't have this weird kind of hole indentation and you know, add a little protection. If they ever wanted to use that computer again, these uh, connectors will be um, protected underneath 
and ready to go. So on to the second one. And from here, these guys are going to be put into the ultrasonic cleaner. I pre-treat them with a little bit of degreaser inside to kind of break up any kind of old grease. What typically happens on these guys is over a period of time, if they've never been flushed out before, there's a manufactured grease from Shimano and it hardens over time and it prevents those poles to engage or catch. So once you put that degreaser in there, it helps soften it up. But the ultrasonic cleaner has a heating element, so it's like 50, 50 degrees Celsius. That really helps kind of break up and also with the uh, ultrasonic vibration cleans that out. And when I put them in there, I expose them open like this so they kind of get as much in there and I flush it out with hot water and that usually really gets a lot of that stuff out of there. And then when I replenish it with a new lube, once it's dried out with the TriFlow uh, Superior Lube, which is a lighter lube, which is not gonna build up and you get that crisp shifting back to life. I get about 80% of these back to life and almost new like. They're still like that 15 to 20% of them, they're just dead. Uh, they died or you just can't get it all cleaned out. It's too gunked up, but most of the times. And you're looking at these where the shifter covers are pretty much in immaculate shape. These always got dinged up and boogered up and smashed. I have a baggie full of them to the point that I actually had some 3D printed and produced for me just to replace them that, you know, cover up the ugliness. So. There lies that little trick. But these guys are they're only aesthetic. They're only for looking pretty. Um, they have no function, but they always got dinged up and smashed. But in any case, here we go. On to the second one, clean the rest of the parts, and then we'll get into detailing the frame. Here we go, we got the wheels all clean, ceramic surfaced and polished, ready to chew and go. And componentry, all clean and you put all this back together. And lube all the parts with TriFlow Superior Lube. The shifters came out live and well and did some ceramic coating to the parts. It, but hey, check this out candy gloss shine two layers stacked of ceramic slam from lithium that is one amazingly preserved frame but yeah let's dive into reassembling all this so lubing parts i'm going to put Some superior lube on the pivots, as well as any kind of rust potential spots and so forth for the brakes. That way it actually works a lot smoother because, because using an ultrasonic cleaner, it does blow out any kind of uh, lubing qualities. And Derailers. Now we'll put the pulleys back together and lube the inside here. Also, pivots. Give it a good massage. And 
the foam is what I use for the shifters because it kind of absorbs all inside there. Shoots in a little bits. I'm trying to get it to cycle through very cleanly prior to install. And yeah, that's way better than it was for sure. Wipe off any excess. It'll drip out a little bit too. On to the next. So, gonna resemble, gonna fix the camera, and just have me slam it together. So here we have it, pretty much reassembled. Need to add a couple of little tidbits. But other than that, it's basically the chain, cables and housing and bar tape wrap and so forth. So we're almost at the finish line at this point. This bike is gonna be almost like new condition, actually probably better than new when you look at particular details of, you know, bottom bracket headset's been redone, the frame is a ceramic coating, high gloss, and the wheels themselves as well being polished and in fine tune performance. This thing's gonna be a rocket. I hope this guy really enjoys his refreshed ride that years pass. I basically resurrected this from the bike of riding from Seattle to Oregon to the Ragbri to double biathlons or whatever he has been done with this bike. After this, it's not gonna show it whatsoever. One thing that's gonna show it is the tags they left behind. Well, again, thank you for hanging out with me in the garage. This is what I use and other details are in the description below. If you have any questions or comments of what you do on your bike or things you'd like to see, please throw them in the comments as well. It's a community piece. Hey, thank you for hanging out with me in the garage. If it's nice in your neck of the woods, please go for a ride. But before that, please check out these awesome pictures once completed.